Uh, next, uh, persons against non-state torture, uh, Ms. McDonald and Ms. Sarson. I presume you're going to divide your time. I'll leave that up to you, but uh, the next five minutes is all yours. Welcome. Thank you. Am I mic on yet? Yes. Okay. I'm Linda McDonald, and this is Jean Sarson, and we are persons against non-state torture and are members of the National Council of Women of Canada. We are retired public health nurses, grassroots feminist activists, and for 31 years have supported women in Canada who have been subjected to torture by non-state actors or non-state torture, starting with one woman in our community from Nova Scotia. We proudly bring these women's voices, many having endured non-state torture from infancy onward, and they all have endured grave discrimination. Non-state torture is torture that occurs in the domestic or private sphere, in relationships perpetrated within families, in human trafficking, in prostitution, in pornographic exploitation, in violent groups and gangs, dismissed as social, cultural, traditional, or religious acts or norms, and can be committed through migration, displacement, and humanitarian unrest. Non-state actors defined by the UN Security Council are any individual or entity not acting under the lawful authority of the state. Acts of non-state torture are intentional and can include mental or physical severe pain and suffering with electric shocking, water torture, forced drugging, group or gang raping, beatings, whippings, cutting, burning, forced impregnation, and abortions. Because Canada's criminal code lacks a law against non-state torture, the women are invisibilized, pathologized, and mislabeled mentally ill. Their normal responses to non-state torture are seen as a disorder and discrimination prevents them from receiving the proper mental health care they need to heal with dignity from such serious crimes and human rights violations. A simple example is Sarah, a survivor of non-state torture getting blood work at our local hospital. Seeing blood tubes in the elevator, she got triggered and fell to the floor. The hospital staff misunderstood her response, placed her on a stretcher with raised side rails, and watched by a uniformed commissioner stopped her from escaping. After eight hours, she called us in the hospital and we helped settle her. If the staff had understood this is a normal response to the torture terror of seeing her own blood, this eight hour ordeal could have been prevented. Using our own victimization, traumatization informed model of care, we have been successful in helping women heal from non-state torture. Uh, I will continue, and I will offer evidence-based and victim-centered research. We are not alone in identifying and understanding the mental health differences between non-state torture and assault or abuse victimizations. Our research questionnaire asked citizens whether 48 violent behaviors were indicative of assault, abuse, or non-state torture, if many or all were inflicted on one person. Of 776 respondents, 723, 93% were Canadian. 680, 88% were female respondents. 89, 12% were male, seven unanswered or said other. 7% were from other countries. 8% came via the, our website or regular mail. This questionnaire also asked, if you were forced to choose between being a victim of abuse, assault, or non-state torture, which would you choose? 680, 88% chose assault or abuse. Explaining non-state tortured was more life-threatening, more dehumanizing, more painful, more difficult to heal from, and being disbelieved. 6% were undecided or did not answer. 6% chose non-state torture, as two women explained that's all they knew. One woman said, I was brought into a child sex trafficking ring by my father when I was around the age of four. Most of what I was put through in this ring I consider to be torture. I am still having powerful flashbacks, which include body memories to this torture. 
And the other woman said, I was definitely tortured. I use this term to help health care professionals and others understand my childhood and not minimize it. Our three recommendations are to criminalize torture perpetrated by non-state actors as a torture crime, to recognize non-state torture, victimization, traumatization, informed care, and education on violence against women must include non-state torture victimization. Women cannot mentally heal when social political injustice dehumanizes them as persons with no legal right to truth tell, not treated with dignity, disbelieved, and not protected from non-state tortures. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're now going to begin with rounds of questions, starting with the Conservatives. Ms. Roberts, please, for six minutes. Uh, thank you. Um Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses. I commend you. Your work is so important, and I, I, I applaud you. So I'm going to start with uh, Linda and Jean. And I have to tell you, if you haven't read their book, don't read it at night before you go to bed. Um, so I'm going to quote a few things, because I want to get to the torture part, because I think women, um, this non-state and state torture is not fair. So I'm going to start by a quote on page 15 of your book from Sarah. No hope for people like me. Page 27 quote from Sarah. Father was using her for his friends, and her aunt was making her sleep with her son and making them do things while she watched. And that dogs were used. Page 33 quote in 2020. In 1993, the world did not acknowledge such dehumanization brutally as non-state torture as a form of violence being inflicted on girls and women within family relationships. Sarah feared she would self-harm herself if she could not get out. And she kept repeating, get out, get out, get out, which meant all crimes perpetrated against her. She said, I know they didn't want me to die because I was their commodity. I could go on and on. There's many, many quotes that really touched me when I read through a lot of the um, information in her book, in your book. And one of the things that really shocked me was when she said, big people, adults, ministers, government workers, cops, pilots, basement orgies are like other people having parties or Tupperware, et cetera, and being taken way back in woods and tortured and raped continuously. So my question to you is, the study we're conducting today on women's mental health, so let me ask you this. If a woman has suffered horrible atrocities from the hands of a family member, a spouse, or stranger, and the Canadian legal system does not acknowledge that she has been put through is torture, what would, you, what would that do to women's mental health? For example, gang rape has been acknowledged by the United Nations as torture, but the Canadian criminal, criminal Code does not. So what happens to the women's mental health who has finally had the courage to step up and name her torturer and have the legal system say, no, you didn't experience torture? I'll, I'll leave it to one, Linda or Jean to answer, please. What happens to them? Well, Linda and I, in 1993, when Sarah came to us, we had no idea that in families uh, torture happened. So what we learned is that they survived by disassociation. Sarah did not know she was a human being. She did not know. When we said to her, Sarah, you're a human being, she said, nobody ever told me that. She thought she was an it, an IT. That's how she... Uh, explained herself as a human being. I was an it. And some women, um, and Sarah included, often when she was trying to heal, she would want to hold her hand because she said she could not feel any sensation. Because in order to survive, they have to cut off their senses. They cut off their smell, they cut off their sense, physical sense, they uh, cut off their visual sense. I was sitting outdoors with Sarah one day, 
in the fall, and all of a sudden she said, look, look at the trees. They're turning color. She said that she had only seen in black and white, and we see that over and over again. And when you reference the issue to get out, get out, it was the fact that the torture memories were so heavy, and if they're not listened to, they don't know what else to do. So as other people have said here, they start cutting, they self-drugging, they have difficulty with the food they eat, and they also go into, uh, for Sarah, she was also taught by her parents to, um, if you will, die by suicide. When she was a little girl, they used to put her, this is her telling, in the hallway and teach her how to cut her wrists if she ever told. So when we met her, she was almost 30 years old. She was a professional, she had a professional job, and she was still living two lives. And people seem to not understand that. Yet we know that in domestic violence, women go to work, they go to work, they go home and get beaten. She was a professional, she went to work, she went home, even almost at 30, was still being tortured, was still being trafficked, and still did not understand that what she was living was uh, violence. And what we have to understand, it takes time for them to understand what they've been going through, because survival, she was a, a baby, and it, the torture started then. So I just want to say one thing, because I know I don't have a lot of time. So there was a quote on page 43, I have lived my life doing what others wanted me to do with the hope they might love me or come to care for me even a little. So I want to thank you, Jean and Linda, for saving her because reading this book has taught me a lot. And I think that the non-state uh, non torture and torture, it really, it, it's, it's very similar. How can, how can a country like Canada not look at this as torture? This woman that you were able to save today, that was torture. Mm -hmm. That, I, that, so go ahead, Linda, yeah, sorry. And what I wanted to do is, uh, is explain how Sarah and all the women feel because there's no law in our country. Right. It's one thing to be dehumanized by your family or traffickers or in prostitution or in pornography, but it's another to be dehumanized by your country because they are, they are told by their country that all Sarah endured 20,000 rapes by the age of 20. So if we want to call that assault in our country, that is an injustice, a grave injustice to her. It's, it, it reinforces that she's an it and that nobody will ever believe her. And, you know, how do we know, how do we say that women in conflict that are gang raped, they were tortured, but yet in our own country, Sarah, who was gang raped, or women after a hockey game were gang raped, how do we say to them that it's, an, it's assault, it's not, it's not torture? So that's the injustice that we're telling them, that they don't, they're not as important, and um, it's a form of discrimination that they live with every day. It to you, Jean and Linda, because the first time I met you throughout during COVID, we talked about a young woman being tied to, a, I think, a radiator. I think that was one of the first stories that you shared with me. And when we're looking at counselling, what is available? Because it's so you can't even get into a, a counsellor just for simple mental health issues. Whether and, and I know anxiety is not simple, but when we're talking about the complex trauma of human trafficking, what is available? Who is educated to help counseling? What do we have here in Canada to help uh, help save some of these young women from the mental torture that they're going to continue for the rest of their lives? What can we do? Well, as far as the torture and human trafficking, um, the only place that we know that took on the model that we created was in Lon the London Abuse Centre. Other than that, we have uh, emails. Uh, I answered an email this week from a woman whose daughter was tortured in trafficking. And I just have to tell her in Canada, where you live, there's no one that I know of that can help, not, not in the way that she needs. And I just wanted to tell some of the, some of the reasons why the trauma informed, victimization trauma-informed care is so important. Because things disappear, like they stop being suicidal. They, they stop uh, being triggered. They stop disassociating. They're, they're able to sleep at night. They go off medication. They get a they go off disability, they get a quality of life where they can have fun and joy and just be free to be themselves. And so the story is, I know it's hard to read at night, Anna, 
but the story is a good story because it's a positive story if we just embrace their reality and know that there, you, if you can heal from torture, you can heal from anything because it's the worst crime on, on the face of the earth. And there's just no, there's no place for them in this country yet because we don't have the law. And then, of course, because we don't have the law, we don't have the care that they need and deserve. Okay. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Thank you very much. And this will be my last uh, turn. So I'll try to sum up everything that's been said. Um, Ms. McDonald, you talked about traumatisms, trauma rather, a lot, and uh, collective rape um, in, 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 in hockey circles. At this other committee, we had a main recommendation on that because we've been talking about providing more money to health research, but another recommendation is on the a mental health issue and an, an independent inquiry into this culture of um, mis misogyny in these circles. Um, how would you consider that? Um, how, do you think that would be a valuable recommendation? Valuable recommendation. Thank you for the question, but I'd like them to also um, understand that torture would be involved in, in the, um, you don't have the uh, translation. Should I wait? <coughs> Is it working now? Okay. Okay. Yeah. J'espère que mon temps est arrêté. I hope that my time was paused. Um, Yes, I think that that would be very important, but I also think in studying the misogyny and the violence in sports that um, we expand our understanding of the type of violence to include torture, especially gang rape, because there's different goals with abuse versus torture with perpetrators. With goal uh, of abuse, the goal is to control the person, the woman, and with torture it is to destroy the woman's sense of self. And I think that's why it's so uh, it, horrific for women to come forward that have been gang raped, because they're so shattered. If you can imagine rows of men coming at you when you're incapacitated, um, it's, it's a violation that needs to really be understood in the misogyny that happens in our country. That is the subject of the next uh, study that I will be bringing before the status of women, coercive, uh, coercive control. So I have just 30 seconds left, but um, uh, if you could uh, answer the next question. We had a report on mental health of young women, and there is a legislation about uh, hate, online hate. What aspects do you think should be covered when it comes to hate against women? is hate against women. I think we have to keep naming it and we have to keep uh, saying that it's the system. The system does it over and over again. And if we want justice, justice starts on the hill. It starts with naming the crime so people can tell the truth and be heard and believed. And misogyny prevents that. Ms. Ms. Roberts, for five minutes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I think um, I'm, my question's going to, uh, I'm going to ask my questions to both Jean and Linda. And before I ask the question, I, I need, the question I'm going to ask is, I need to know from your explanation the difference between state and non-state torture, because in Canada, Canada does not recognize non-state torture. And the reason I'm bringing this up is, uh, I'm sure everybody's heard about the young girl that was raped and tortured at 11 years old, Carrie Kehoe, and she, nobody believed her. Nobody believed that she was tortured. Nobody believed she was raped. He, the, gen, the gentleman, no, the rapist, um, finally got arrested and was let out on parole. So she is reliving all her experiences all over again. So my question to you is, how do we change the justice system in this country to realize that that is torture, not abuse, it's torture, so that if we can make it torture, we can increase the sentences so that these guys don't have an opportunity to get out of jail and re-victimize the victims? Great, great job. Okay, th that is an excellent question because it's one Linda and I were shocked about in 1993 when Sarah came to us and said I was tortured 
And we looked around and were shocked to find out that Canada does not recognize torture by non-state actors. So then we went global to try to understand the discrimination that occurs in the law, and we found out that in Canada, 269.1 says very clearly that the only tortures can be a public official, a police officer, or a military officer, because um, they didn't think that women and girls or children were ever tortured in the private domain. Because back then in the 80s, when the Convention Against Torture was created, violence against women and children in the family was a family matter. Everybody knew about it, but nobody paid any attention to it. So what, what has happened, in our opinion, is that when the convention was rolled out and it had discrimination in it, that it only happened really to men in warring or men in terrorism, that countries all over this planet decided to make a law that mimicked the convention, which said that uh, it could only be a public official. Nobody ever thought of women. And Linda and I work with a group in Vienna, and we asked one of the experts when they were creating the convention, did you ever think of women and children? And he just said, no, it wasn't even a thought in our mind. So that created the discrimination, and it's rolled out across this planet. So for us, we think it's really important um, that the UN has been trying to change that attitude for example, the Committee Against Torture in 2008 in paragraph 18 said very clearly that non-state actors commit torture and the country should look at that and change their law. And women and men in this country might be surprised that it was only in 1993 that it was acknowledged that abuse and torture of women, and uh, they were talking about women at the, um, the Convention on Human Rights in 1993 in Vienna. That was the first time in the human rights history, really, around the conventions, that the issue of abuse and torture of women came up in 1993. So we're very new at the issues that we're all talking about here. That's not very long time. So um, also the CEDAW committee, which is um, to remove discrimination, and Canada has ratified both of these uh, conventions. They too are trying to catch up with modern times and in their last recommendation, number 35, they also brought in uh, non-state actors that they can commit torture. So I wanna just read from page 45. This is what torture is. It is the destruction of human being. It is the actions of a torturer that dehumanizes and attempts to destroy another human being. It is a bone chilling reality. And I think, and I believe from reading your book that this is what Sarah and some of the women that you helped have experienced. So we need to, at the federal level, ensure that we bring a law forward to change it to let people know that what these victims are going through is not abuse, it's no. torture. And I gotta tell you, some of the descriptions in the book, I mean, I had tears in my eyes just reading it, because this is what they're doing to our children. We Thank as you. women have to stand up for them because our justice system has failed us. Thank you. I, I would like to add a little bit about babies for the discussion that we've had. The one issue that hasn't come up is that uh, this can be intergenerational. And the women have told us that if that's not talked about in prenatal care, if it's not talked about in labor and delivery, that uh, these families get missed. And the women that we've uh, supported all they ever wanted to do was to be taken out of their families. Okay. But Thank you. If, if we don't name that torture can be happening in families, we have blank spots about our knowledge. So there's okay. uh, sufficient knowledge out there now that we can do better than we're doing. Thank you.